Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for another night of instructor presentations. If this is your first rodeo with us, this is how the night works. Our visiting instructors take turns giving 10 minute presentations about their work and themselves. It's actually a really fun night. And we have four instructors this evening. Our first instructor is in the glass studio, Cynthia Fisher, and the assistant introducing is Maggie Seinfeld. Hi everyone, my name is Maggie Seinfeld. I am the 2D photography mixed media assistant here at Peters Valley and I'm here to introduce Cynthia Fisher. Cynthia Fisher has been creating mosaics since the 2000s. Uh, formerly a children's book illustrator, she found the allure of the mosaic medium irresistible and established her studio Big Bang Mosaics in rural Western Mass. Her award-winning work can be found in large-scale public art setting nationwide. So without further ado, please welcome Cynthia Fisher. Hi, everybody. Okay, so jumping right in, um, I thought I'd do something a little different tonight and show you a picture of where I come from in rural Western Massachusetts. Um, my husband uh, built our house when he was started building our house when he was 23 and he bought three acres of land for $1,500 and he had a um, one room cabin. Um, I came along maybe 15 years later and uh, learned how to do carpentry and helped a lot. So this is what our house looks like now. And I did all the stonework um, at it. Um, and when I started doing mosaics in 2000, I of course decided we should have a lot of mosaics on the house. So some of them are built in and some of them are just wall hangings, but uh, this is just the outside of the house. The inside has a lot more. Uh, in about, so right after I started doing mosaics, um, as um, Kelly said, I had been a children's book illustrator and I had a really small studio in the house. That was not going to work being a mosaic artist. So we built a straw bale barn, which is this. For a while, we had a mammoth donkey and a horse that lived underneath me in the lowest level of the barn, but um, they're gone now. Um, so this is kind of the entryway into my studio. My studio is through the yellow door. And the reason that I'm including this picture is for you to look at the tile on the counter because actually what I'm going to focus on in the beginning of my presentation is a project that I just finished working on, which is a splash pad. You guys heard of a splash pad? Some of you are shaking your head. So basically it's a place for kids to play um, with um, on a surface where water shoots up. So I was involved in the one in the upper right-hand corner. That one's 50 feet in diameter, 52 feet in diameter, which is huge. And I um, was collaborating with an artist who lives in Florida on that project. And we did the whole thing down in Florida and worked on the floor, which was actually pretty awful, <laughs> sitting on the floor every day. Um, and then the, mosaic, the picture in the bottom right is a, mo is a splash pad that I did for Lauder Hill, another city nearby. Now it's opening day. And then the drawing on the left is the one that I just finished working on, which is 35 feet across. These are all kids drawings that kids in the town of Tamarack did. And the uh, um, little, the black spots are all where the water's gonna um, shoot out. So the start of the project, um, working on something this big is pretty incredible when you don't have a big studio because my studio is 24 feet long and 12 feet wide. So um, that's my work table up on the side because my first step was to make a template for the whole thing. So you guys are actually getting some very arcane information here on how a splash pad goes together. Not many people would ever um, have called to need that, but that's what I'm gonna share with you. So the first step was making this template that's 17 by 17, because I divided the whole thing into quarters. And, um, and then I had enlarged all of those drawings so that the kid who actually drew this cat, the cat was probably four inches across. And now that cat is um, like that big. So and it's actually kind of a fun part of it that they're, the, the pictures are so, uh, I mean, their images are huge. And then I um, had to make special table extensions and put the whole thing up on the table and basically could work on like a four foot strip at a time, four feet by 17 feet. So I would lay the whole thing out 
And you can see in the foreground the tile um, from the previous row that has to be left because I have to continue the same exact. Um, there, there can't be any cut ups as I go along because everything has to fit together again. So when I go down to Florida, it all has to go together as a unit. So that's what it looks like kind of on the table. Um, this is like the second to last row of the whole thing. Uh, I worked on this for about seven months, just the laying of the tile. Uh, the planning for the whole thing took forever. Uh, there's so many things that had to go into figuring out not only how to do it, but how to do it so, and then get it down to Florida. So everything had to be cut up to be put onto pallets, and then the pallets are going to get shipped down. So there's a section. So once I finished a whole row, I put sticky paper, adhesive on the top of it, that's really strong um, stuff, had to measure everything off so that it would fit on the pallets, um, which are 42 by 48. And then I would cut them up and flip them over and mark everything really well. And I took pictures of everything. So those are just um, a few details. I actually really had fun working on this because it totally took me through COVID. But by the end, I was totally ready to be done. Um, and so this is what the project looks like right now in my barn. Um, it's all stacked up. Um, it's way too much to go on one pallet. So I actually have to um, divide it. It'll probably get shipped down on three separate pallets. Um, and that will be later in the year when I will go down. I'm hiring an installation team to put it together because I have the skills to do that, but I'm not a tile setter and that's really a tile setting job. And actually I, the, one of the, the other splash pads I did with a team, um, I mean, a, a, a pool company and he had four or five workers and they were fantastic. And so I'm hoping to work with them again. So um, this is for the city of Tamarack in Florida. And in addition to um, the splash pad, I did an amphitheater wall, which that's the elevation of it down below. Um, and these are each 45 inches wide and six feet high. And there are 13 panels all together. So those are the seven um, central ones. Um, the theme for this was um, metamorphosis because this um, city of Tamarack used to be a retirement community and now the population is really changing and it's a lot more diverse and they're very proud of that diversity. So it's kind of my theme was to have it sort of show how the community has changed. I include this, this guy's my favorite. So another thing I do, that's Tamarack. Um, I also do, um, well, as a mosaic artist, you have to do lots of things because you never know where your next job is going to come from. And so um, it's always good to have several avenues of finding work. So I also go down to Guatemala and do community projects. And I brought um, several groups down there. This one we did in um, on there anywhere? 2020. Yeah, we finished this right before COVID hit. Yeah, so I had, so there's a, a guy um, down there, Walter, who is um, Guatemalan and he's a photographer and he took, takes great pictures of people. So that's where I got the, the image from. And then this was worked on by Americans and um, Guatemalans. I also do um, residential work. This is a piece I did for a bathroom. Um, it's actually like this high, that wide, but it's based on a mosaic that was done uh, 2000 years ago in Sicily and they're almost life-size figures, but it's really cool because it's all these female athletes. And um, 2018, I went on a bike trip, um, bicycle ride down in Patagonia for three and a half weeks. Um, I'm an avid cyclist. And it was a fabulous trip. And I did some um, fine art pieces. Also, when I'm not doing my commission work, I always try and find time to do my own personal abstract stuff. So those are a couple examples. And then the slide that you saw in the beginning, um, one of my mosaics was chosen to be the cover of a math book. Um, that's a math-based mosaic. And um, doing science and math as starting points for mosaics is something I really like to do. That's it. Thank you.
Thank you, Cynthia. Our next instructor speaking this evening over in the Wood Studio, we've got Kimberly Winkle and our assistant in that studio is Kat Nash. Hello, um, I'm Kat Nash. I'm the Woodshop assistant and I'm here to introduce Kim Winkle. Kim is a maker who creates furniture and objects using wood and paint. Her work displays a balance of form, color and surface pattern. She has been awarded several residencies at State University New York uh, Haystack Mountain School of Crafts, Anderson Ranch Center for um, Art, and the Appalachian Center for Craft. Uh, Winkle is a professor and director of the School of Arts, Art, Craft, and Design at Tennessee Technology University. She holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Ceramics from the University of Oklahoma and an MFA in Furniture Design from San Diego State University. She teaches across the United States and shares her knowledge with, knowledge with places like Peters Valley anytime she can. Welcome to the stage, Kim Winkle. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm really happy to be here again. This is my second time teaching at Peters Valley. Um, I really enjoy teaching at craft schools. I think they're really important places in the world. Um, and to spread craft and the ability to make something with your hands is really empowering and I think important. So thank you. And thanks to Jamie and Kat for having everything so nicely prepared and organized in the wood shop. It makes my job a lot easier and makes the experience for our class a lot more enjoyable. So thank you. So moving right in, as Kat mentioned, I'm from Oklahoma. Um, I grew up um, born and raised in Oklahoma, very adventurous and curious as a young child and even today. Um, I received my Bachelor of Fine Arts in Ceramics and then went straight to graduate school in San Diego at San Diego State University where I started my studies in ceramics, but my second semester, I took a wood class with this woman here named Wendy Mariama. If you have ever met her or are familiar with her or contemporary craft or studio art furniture, you know that she's a force to be reckoned with. So fortunately for me, um, she saw some potential and interest and encouraged me to go down the path of furniture making, which I did. And let's see, that started in spring of 99. And I haven't regretted the decision since. So this was the first project we were tasked with making in the intro to wood class, which was a vessel. And you can see how my experience with the plastic three-dimensional form, understanding shape and volume was useful to me in this shaped project. This is Jelutong wood that's been carved and painted in a heavy application of surface adornment, which you will see throughout the series of these slides um, is a common theme. So in the program, we were charged with trying to not only develop technical proficiency, but also to learn how to express our ideas uniquely through the format of furniture. So we weren't tethered to tradition. We did learn traditional and proper techniques for construction, but we weren't tethered to traditional forms. When I graduated, I applied for a couple of residencies and I chose to move to Tennessee. Right in the middle, um, you see that star and the first dot to the right of that star is a town called Cookville. I live right near that town. And I went to a school called the Appalachian Center for Craft. It's a year long residency. I arrived August 15th, 2002, planning to be there one year and I'm still there. So uh, things worked out, I guess we should say. You can see it's a beautiful location. It looks a lot like here. Um, it's right on a lake, Center Hill Lake. And it's really picturesque, provides a lot of inspiration and it's a really nice place to live. So when I got there, I, my work changed dramatically. Um, I was no longer part of an academic program where I had to justify the things that I made. I could make something because I liked green, where I could make something because I liked unusual and quirky proportions, which are both, both of those statements are true. And so you can see that revealed in this table here. So this was actually the first thing I made when I arrived to the craft center. I was able to revisit some ceramic skills by putting those little pieces of MDF. This was before I learned how to turn with a thick smear of gesso, put it on the potter's wheel and while the gesso was wet, just incised those lines. While I was there, I also learned how to turn, which really changed the trajectory of my work and which is why I'm standing before you now. Um, this is another piece I made during the residency. It's close to seven feet tall, almost four feet wide. Um, it's a mirror that you can slide along wherever you want along a wall. Playing a lot with shaping, playing a lot with color, and playing a lot with surface ornamentation. Having the real luxury to dive into books, um, there was a big 
G's Bend quilt show in Memphis around this time that I was able to see that was just spectacular. And so it was really eye opening. And so this, this is the stuff I'm making during the residency, learning how to turn, but not feeling like I have to make a functional salad bowl, that a bowl can be a sculptural object or it can be a more stereotypical typical uh, functional item. Both are, have a lot of value and of equal importance, but I was more interested in the sculptural form. So these are some of the things that I've made since learning those techniques. Um, I developed a, a couple of little limited edition product lines. This is one of them to pay the student loans. And also um, it's a good exercise to go through. These are Oculus mirrors named Oculus after the opening of a classical dome. I oftentimes will make multiples of the same piece and I use them um, of, in sort of like a sketchbook. I'm not afraid to just try different patterns on the surface if I have multiples of them. And I'm unafraid to, make, to do this exploration on the 3D form, but a 2D form is frightening to me for some reason. I don't understand. Um, this is a table, looks like three tables, but they're all combined by the attached bottom. All of the elements are turned on the lathe with the exception of the black base, which is carved and it looks like it was turned on the lathe. Um, I call it odd man out because the guy in the middle is a little sock is a little lower and the lines on the tabletop run perpendicularly to the, those on the sides. So you can see there are sort of streamlined understated forms, but the surfaces are heavily activated through color and mark making. Where I am in Tennessee, I live fairly close to a couple of Shaker villages. Um, one is Pleasant Hill in Kentucky and another is um, South Union in Bowling Green. So this, I was inspired by the sort of simple understated forms and used um, them as starting points for creating my own version. So this pair of hangers was inspired by this little twig hanger that I saw at South Union. Um, I hired a blacksmith to do the blacksmithing. Blanket chest. So this is cherry. The inside is, is also heavily adorned for the furniture proctologists that look inside or underneath. We don't want them to be disappointed. It's lined in aromatic cedar. Then I did a residency in 2011 at the Center for Art and Wood in Philadelphia and um, was playing around with this, this house form. And it's something that still continues to show up in my work. So this law, tall sort of totemic form that has this wire basket beneath, those little houses are supposed to represent memories, good, bad, and sort of neutral. And then taking the idea of this, which occupies a lot of physical space, even though it's mostly air, and then translating it into actual space. So this is a split turning. It's about 40 inches long. It's two halves. It's a turning that is two halves glued together with a paper seam in the middle. After you turn, you can take a, a heavy um, chisel and bust it apart, and the paper basically tears into two thin, thinner halves. And so you end up with mirror images of each other. And then the top is a, a platter, a cherry platter that was cut in half. The little house is aluminum that was painted. And so playing with this sort of, I sort of see this house as sort of this um, omnipotent, omnipresent form that has a lot of capability despite its humbleness. Um, what comes to mind when I was making these are Andrew Wyeth, Christina's World. I can see Christina down on the, you know, on the grass looking up at the hillside and, and the, the house on top, which always seems so victorious. A small box, each of these little houses inside are sort of like gemstones, so hence the title geode. Um, a long table, I'm from Oklahoma, and if you've ever been to Oklahoma, um, you may know that the landscape is almost perfectly flat in its entirety. And so I love that. I love the openness because it seems like nothing is holding you in. And so I was using that sort of reference as um, the inspiration for this tabletop. So it's a long skinny table. The tabletop itself is carved with a bunch of tiny little bitty V cuts and then layers of paint to sort of mimic grass. The houses are not affixed. So somebody could move them along wherever they want to sort of create their own sort of relationship amongst them as, as other people, like clusters of people and watching like relationships that form. Again, playing with the same idea, I was teaching a class at, at, at Penland. And so I constructed this as part of the demo in the class. Um, it's, a, it's a bandsaw box at the top. 
Another variation on split turning in my version of a demi loon table, which is a traditional form, but this is a very untraditional take on that form. Two different sizes of split turning. So there's another version of this in green. These are little side tables. They actually sit right next to my sofa, which worked perfectly. And then this was um, while I was at Purchase College doing a residency. I needed a bed, so I made myself a bed. And then um, here's a detail of the headboard. It's cherry. I was using, um, in, from inspiration, I'm, like I said, I'm from Oklahoma. I'm an enrolled member of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. So some of the work that's on there, those motifs are variation stylized versions of patchwork designs. Um, so we have a turtle on the left, there's a deer in the middle, just an ornamental one, and then a man on horseback on the far right. Um, this is a couple, two benches are the next couple of images. Again, variations on the theme, long slab, a bunch of legs. Nobody said a bench only has to have four legs. Why can't it have 10 or 12? And then another little bench with sort of this fantastical, I kind of see it as a coxcomb, even though the color is not characteristic of a rooster. Um, and so anyway, this, this is where I am, what I make. This week in my class, we're doing, um, we're starting from scratch. We started with some spindle turning today. We're gonna work our way through spindle turning and faceplate, like I told them and I'll tell you, everything in wood turning is a variation of a bead and a cove. And everything that you saw in the slides are variations of the bead and the cove. Um, I'm really grateful that the craft school education gave me the skills to turn wood and I hope to impart the same knowledge and inspiration in my class. So thanks very much. Thank you, Kim. It was good to hear about your work. Next, we have our blacksmithing instructor. Jim Masterson, and our assistant is Sean Fitzsimmons. Hi everyone, I'm Sean Fitzsimmons, the assistant in the blacksmithing shop. I'm here to introduce Jim Masterson. He's originally from the St. Louis area. He's been blacksmithing since 1985, where he got his start at SIU Edwardsville. Then he finished his master's up at Miami of Ohio. Currently, he's the lead designer and shop foreman at the... Um, Museum of Metal in Memphis, Tennessee. He uh, has a passion for teaching. He likes to do something different every day in the metal shop. Um, and he'll show you some of his work right now, a special project he's been working on down there. Uh, people of Peters Valley, I uh, give you Jim Masterson, the magician of Memphis. So uh, I work for the National Ornamental Metal Museum. And what's great about the museum is we have a full blacksmith shop and foundry and we have artists who work there full time and we take on everything from private commission work to public art to restoration and repair work. This project here was our local um, science and history museum in Memphis asked us to make them a Mosasaurus dinosaur. And they have a currently have a, a skeleton in their collection, a Mosasaurus that is 98% complete which is pretty rare for a lot of the dinosaurs and stuff. And they had a show going on at the time that was um, um, Dinosaurs in Motion. And it was a, an artist, John Payne out of uh, North Carolina who made dinosaurs that were, had motors and gears and pulleys and they were set up with uh, sensors. So when you walked up to them, they started moving and it just, kids loved it, they, they really did. So we decided, they came to us and said, we want to make a Mosasaurus dinosaur for the entrance of our museum. And so we got together, the picture on the left is our little 3D model. We sort of stuck in there. Uh, the picture on the right is their guard shack. We yanked the guard shack out and got rid of it. Um, the trees that are sitting right there uh, are the trees where our Mosasaurus is going to come down swimming into. So we, we decided, this is where we need to go with this. How do we wrap our mind around this thing? So luckily, somebody out there had scanned this dinosaur bone by bone and put it out there on the internet. We bought it, put it into the scale we want, and we could go into every bone we needed and grab any bone anywhere along there and get all the measurements that we wanted from it. It was fantastic. I. God bless that person. Um, 
this is the dinosaur itself. Uh, all the lines that you see coming up on the sides are the site. We went and did a site survey. The dinosaur, the pink dots that you see on him are actually when we did his backbone in the shop, we took the survey tool and we put points on him in the shop. Then we took the two of those together and put them in the, the X's that you see on the sides are actually columns that hold gates on either side of the, uh, of the Mosasaurus itself. But um, a big portion of him, we took and um, forged a lot of him, but important things like his, um, his um, skull and the parts that you see in yellow, we had our foundry cast them. And they went in and they sculpted foam and then they put um, um, stage prop like gesso type over the top of them. And these are some of the bones that are in there. There's 110 vertebrae in a Mosasaurus dinosaur, four different types in there. The one up on the left, there were uh, 27 of them and they started at the back of the neck and they went certain part down the body. The one on the, over in the corner there, there were only eight of those. And then it went back to another 27 and then all the rest were out that what became the tail in the back. Uh, these are parts for our dinosaur. Uh, you can see pieces up where we took actual pipe and certain parts we had laser cut and then we forged them to save time. And then all these components were put into jigs and we made jigs for making vertebrae three, vertebrae two, vertebrae one. We threw lasers on them to keep things uh, aligned. And these are buckets full of all the vertebrae that were in this thing. We made just parts after parts. Um, this is a little shot of the vertebrae. After we put them all together, we laid them out on the floor and somebody ran the camera over the top of them just so you could see what they look like where one changes to another, just depending on what part was holding the ribs, what part went on the waist, where is tail attached, things like that. Um, we got down to the very end and there was another little component we had to make after that. This was the way we bent the backbone or the spine for the dinosaur. And then all the pipe actually slid onto it. One and a half inch round solid, that tool right there on the left is called a flight press. And what we did is we put a meter or a little um, uh, angle finder on it so that we could, as we were moving it through, we could tell what angle we were rotating the spine at so we could get his curve and body and everything in line. Um, it did have a little video go with it, but a couple of the videos weren't quite, weren't quite playing. Um, these are all of his ribs. And the ribs, there were 11 sets of ribs. So there ended up being um, two upper and two lower. So there ended up being um, 22, uh, 44 sets of ribs that we had to go in and forge and shape with the, uh, the parts that we were doing with them. Here was a couple other little videos I was hoping would play too, where we were stacking his uh, vertebrae on and welding them in place in the other one, but they're just not quite playing. They don't like Mac for some reason. <laughs> Um, this is Jake, if everybody remembers Jake Brown. We were forging his femurs or his back on his uh, back legs at the time. And uh, we had to upset a one and a half inch uh, bar that we went in to make his femurs out of for the backs of his legs. This is getting into some of the work that they did in the foundry. They had foam cutters, bought that pink foam that you can buy at Home Depot and went in and started cutting and shaping. All the little pictures you see up at the top are different, um, uh, the 3D models that we were looking in and they were shaping them. And then once they went from there, they went in and they put that foam coat over the top of them, laid them out and we had all of his, these are actually the palms of his flippers that were in there. Um, this is actually the fingers of his bones on his things. We forged it out of tubing just because they became so, would become so heavy that we needed to make sure that we didn't put too much weight on this object that had to sit out in space. So the fingers you say are all hollow tubing, the palms in the back are cast aluminum, and then we attached the two with all stainless hardware. Um, they were welded into place uh, so that 
because aluminum and steel do not get along with each other. You have a galvanic reaction and the aluminum will eat the steel over time. Um, here's one of the flippers attached near the pelvis where that's that femur that you saw earlier. Uh, this is back also, that's one of the main structural posts that holds this piece up in the end. This whole dinosaur actually floats 10 feet off the ground uh, at their entryway. Um, this is the skull with its measurements and everything on it. It had 80 individual teeth. And what we did for the teeth was here was the skull. We sent the, the model out to a place in Cincinnati that has a five axis uh, carving system. And they carved most of the skull for us. They couldn't do the teeth. They said the teeth were too delicate. So we have a printer. So we printed all the teeth. They cut sockets in the bottoms of the uh, jaw and everything. And we put him in, we gave him dentures is basically what he did. And then we were able to take that and put it into the mold. And then sand, all these were sand casts. They were all put in. There's the, the pattern in the center. It, it's mold that was made. That's actually the casting with the runners off the sides. The skull had to be done in 17 different pieces because all the different intricate pattern and everything to get the skull to come out right. And then we welded the whole thing back together. Um, these are the patterns themselves, the foam patterns on the left. That's them in aluminum on the right. Um, these are some of the parts of the skull where you can see where we tacked things together. Parts where runners were still sitting on things, getting them lined up. Then, after we got him together, we went in and fitted him to the body itself. And he actually has a hole that we drilled into the back of the head about four and a half inches, is sleeved with a piece of stainless and he slides onto the backbone. And so you can see the structure inside uh, on his, um, in through his ribs and the back parts of the uh, body that allow him to sit where he needs to sit. We then, popped him on the trailer because he had to go down the road and he couldn't be wider than an eight foot trailer. So that's why we had those uh, posts cut at a certain height. Then we took it down to the painters and they painted everything for us. Uh, then at the job site, we made what's called a lifting bar, which is that big piece of I-beam that you see at the top so that we could keep him because he was such an odd weighted object to keep him exactly where we wanted because we had to bring him down flat. There are some little posts that you see hanging out there and the bottom of that post coming off the dinosaur has a tenon. And so what we did is all the post work was put into um, concrete footings, which are actually 24 inches in diameter, five foot deep. And once that was all set in place, we brought him over and we set him down inside that piece. It took all of about, two hours to actually put him up. From the time we pulled him off the trailer, popped him in place, we had him up in space. Then we had to put him together. And so his, you can see the structure that was up inside where his head attached to it. The flippers themselves would not believe, even though they're aluminum and they're hollow, how heavy those things were. And so they decided to choose um, this orange yellow color because they get a lot of school and they were their darker colors would get lost in the trees when all the trees ended up blooming. And so this is him or her in place. I call him Chester or Mac uh, just because of his color. But uh, those are the posts that come down through the piece. He's sitting up there and that's, that's our dinosaur. That was our 27 foot long dinosaur. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Next, we have in our ceramic studio, Dr. Bill Cardi. He is teaching science and glaze calculation for the artist. And our assistants, we have Grace Kerr and Maggie. Nope, sorry, Molly K. Gettis, I apologize. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Molly Kate Geddes. Um, I'm going to be introducing Dr. Uh, William Cardi this evening. 
Um, he actually started coming here about 15 years ago, and this is his sixth time back at Peters Valley teaching a workshop. Um, he is actually not an artist, like the majority of us here, uh, but an engineer and scientist, um, and he loves working with us because he thinks that we think differently. Um, he was the chair of ceramic engineering at Alfred University in New York. Um, this is where he worked for 27 years before he retired last year. And it was here that Dr. Cardi built a relationship with John Gill. Um, and from this relationship, the um, like outstanding connection between engineering and ceramics happened there. Um, and it's really trickled out through both communities and had a really huge impact for all of us in the ceramics world, at least. Um, and currently, Dr. Cardi does research and consultant work. Um, some previous companies that he's consulted for are Lennox China, Buffalo China, Coors Tech Ceramics, Commons Diesel, Shell, GE, and uh, IBM. Um, and he also consults for what he calls um, art failures to um, figure out kind of what's going wrong to try to fix it, which is super cool. Um, and he's also been a panelist for the National Council on Education for the Ceramic Arts, which is commonly known as NSICA. Um, he would like to tell you guys that he has two really awesome sons. So please help me welcome Dr. Bill William Cardi. Good evening. Uh, thanks for having me. It's been fun. I've known Bruce now for about 15 years. And uh, I think that's a good thing, but I'll determine that later tonight, perhaps. So um, we were I was approached by the Smithsonian about uh, two months ago. So I have a PhD student of mine who uh, went to work for the Smithsonian as a staff scientist, which is the coolest job ever, right? So he calls me up and he says, we have this problem. We want to try to figure out firing temperatures for uh, ancient ceramics, but they're more interested in the firing temperatures for ceramics that were made in Europe in, in the 1800s, early 1800s, basically. And how do you do that? So um, this is sort of an abridged version of that presentation, but I had a student that came from Jingdezhen, China, and he basically uh, was interested in, in the ceramics associated with the Song Dynasty and the Five Dynasties. They were the first porcelains that were produced uh, in, in the world, basically, the invention of porcelain in Jingdezhen. And he came from Jingdezhen, and in basically in this little area that you can see that's in the, the sort of um, uh, green oval, there were all of these kiln sites, like 30 kiln sites located around Jingdezhen. And I was in Jingdezhen in 2019, and we went to the original clay pits, which are in Kowloon Mountain, where they actually mined the clay to make the porcelains. They took it down the river by barge which actually has an important implication for all of this. So um, he was from there and his uh, thesis was to evaluate firing temperatures for ceramics. And we had been working on this for some time. And so we had developed some models basically associated with that. And so what he did was uh, he came in and, and he was able to read the historical records for the consumption of wood in Jingdezhen in this time frame for a year, basically. Now you would think about that as like, oh, what does that mean? They're like, who cares? but they needed wood to fire the kilns. And then it turns out that they could only fire the kilns for about three months in the summertime. So in the spring and the fall, it's too rainy in the winter, the river froze. And so you couldn't transport wood in. So by looking at the amount of wood that they fired, uh, 600,000 uh, 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 loads of wood, and then used in during the gen based on the number of kilns they had, worked out then approximately how long a firing would be uh, for these porcelain samples. It works out to be roughly about seven days. Okay, and that says, oh, okay, what does that mean? Well, the thing is that uh, basically with those seven days, um, you can work out then how long a firing could be. And it turns out that, and it sounds like a lot to us, but the difference in firing time was between three and four days is what you work out from that. They say, oh, well, that's a big difference. That could be, you know, basically three days or four days is big, but it's not. And the reason it's not is because we're not on a linear time scale. So temperature in this system scales linearly. If you go up in temperature, things happen faster. Or you can go on a time scale that is on a log time basis, which means one to 10 to 100 rather than one to three. So three days and four days is basically no difference. It's about 10 degrees difference in terms of temperature. So that actually plays into this in a big way. So the question is, how do we determine how ancient porcelains were fired? And we can do it based on the structure of those materials uh, from a microscopic standpoint. We have four approaches. Something that calls, it's called molite uh, that forms in the body during firing. 
I used to tell my students this all the time. You know how this works. You go to the bar and sooner or later, you're talking about my life. I can't tell you how many times this has happened to me. Um, you think I'm joking, but we are constantly talking about molite in the bar. Um, and then the next is that you could look at the chemistry of the glass phase. And by looking at those two things, you could potentially pinpoint exactly what temperature uh, they were at and how long they were there. And the third is this thing called a quartz dissolution rim. So we have quartz particles in the porcelain and they start dissolving and you get this rim around the outside. And I'll show you a picture of it in a minute that shows you then the dissolution of quartz. And by measuring these things, we could potentially determine the firing temperatures. The fourth, which we don't have time to talk about today is body glaze interactions. I can wax poetic about body glaze interactions should you need help sleeping later tonight. Okay, so these two images on the left, these are primary molite and primary molite on the far left. And then in the middle is actually secondary molite. There's two types of molite that form in the body. The blue circle here represents a human hair. So you have an idea of the scale of this image, right? And, and so in the bottom right here on the right-hand side is a lower magnification image. And there is a picture of a hair that represents that image. So by looking at these images, you get either very, very fine molite crystals or you get larger molecular crystals that form in what are called feldspar relics. And by looking at those two, we can determine then the size of those needles through a technique that's called X-ray diffraction. And we can map then that um, uh, the size of that needle as a function of this picture on the bottom left shows temperature on the horizontal axis and then time on a log scale. So you can see it says 0 0.1, 1, 10, and 100. And then we can look at the size of the molecular needles based on those firing conditions. So we can go in with this technique and we can measure the size of the needle and it these lines, uh, 40 nanometers, 50 nanometers, et cetera. And that tells us the condition under which those are fired and it doesn't deviate. It's really actually very exciting. The second model had to do with glass chemistry. So we look at the glass chemistry and we find that this inset image here shows you 1300, 1250 and 1200 degrees C. I can only function in C, I'm sorry, I can't function in Fahrenheit. And then the x-axis is time again on that log scale. So these things behave very, very regularly. And we come up with this plot on the bottom right, which shows then the amount of silica in the glass phase. And we can take those two images, those two plots, and we can superimpose them. And we end up with, with this plot where we have basically these things intersect. And by looking at those intersection of those points, we can tell then conditions of firing. So we took all that information and we looked at these ancient porcelain samples from China. And guess what? Our samples are here in red in this line that shows the previous model. Those samples did not match our model. So now we have a problem because we predicted what the firing conditions were supposed to be. And we looked at these ancient Chinese samples. They didn't fit our, our firing conditions. So the question is, is our model wrong? That's a hard one. And the answer is yes, by the way. But uh, the question is then, how do we modify our model in order to fit this picture? And so it turns out that in this system, okay, um, model one, molecular needle size is correct. Model two, chemistry of the glass phase is incorrect. So how do we correct it? And it turns out that's this. Quartz dissolves into this body and you get a quartz dissolution rim. So the picture in the upper right shows that quartz particle looks a little bit like, I don't know, Manhattan or something. And around that, there is this region that doesn't have any crystals in it. That's the quartz dissolution rim. And we can measure the thickness of that rim. And when we do that, we find that for a set of conditions, set R1, R2, and R3, we get exactly the same dissolution rim. Oh, that's kind of cool, right? But what that means is that a smaller particle then will dissolve at the same rate as a larger particle. So that quartz dissolution rim stays the same. I say, well, great. Then the silica level should be the same in the glass phase. The problem is if I have a smaller particle with the same quartz level, I have a lot more smaller particles and they're all dissolving at the same rate. So you get a lot more silica in the glass phase. And the consequence of that is I have a quartz size on dissolution of that quartz and the change in the glass chemistry. So can I correct for that? And the answer is that we think we can. And so what we're doing now is we've modified our model to be measuring the molite needle thickness, which we can do with a technique called X-ray diffraction. And then by measuring the coarse dissolution rim, we can predict then exactly the conditions under which these porcelains were firing, were fired at. And so we're applying that technique now to determine firing conditions for porcelains that were produced in Europe in the early and mid 1800s. So here's where we are. There's our coarse dissolution rim. You can see it in a little better image here. 
The mollite on the left, you can see where that stops. And so this quartz particle is dissolving and that silica is going into the glass phase. And we can use that in order to predict the firing temperatures of porcelain. And that wraps it up for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Okay, that concludes our presentations for this evening. Thank you so, so much for being here for this evening and just for being here at Peters Valley. And thank you to the friends who tuned in on Zoom for this event. If you need anything, please let the office know. Otherwise, I really hope you enjoy your workshop. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.